Welcome to the Walter Gropius Master Artist Ceramic Symposium. I'm Kathleen Nisi, Visual Artist in Residence at the Huntington Museum of Art, and we are honored to present the lectures of the six Walter Gropius Master Artists, Linda Christensen, Justin D'Onofrio, Sanama Mami, Chris Gustin, and Michael Hunt and Naomi Dowglish of Bandana Pottery. These six artists were chosen for similar reasons and also ones unique to each of them. All of them share a love of the material of clay and an appreciation for the function of the particular objects that they create. Each of their experiences in clay is individual, but the common thread of education from the past, present, and future, with their instructors being working artists in their field, ties them to the foundation of the Bauhaus. Walter Gropius and his Bauhaus philosophy is permeated throughout educational systems all over the world, and certainly in the settings where many of these artists were taught. While they each have their own individual stories, including working as studio potters, college professors, collaborators, students, and a ceramic arts center founder. It's their ability to share of themselves while continuing to be current in their field that resonates with the Bauhaus and with us all. Linda Christensen is a studio potter living and working in rural Minnesota. Having made pots for over 40 years, she studied at Hamline University in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Banff Center School of Fine Arts in Banff, Alberta, Canada. Christensen has taught at colleges and universities across the United States, and her work is included in numerous private and public collections, including the American Museum of Ceramic Art and the Glenhoe Museum. In her wood-fired pots, Linda Christensen strives to make work that does its duty well, yet can stand on its own as a visual object. Her goal is to make a better cup each day. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm, I'm just so lucky to be here with all of you. And a uh, big uh, shout out to Kathleen and John and uh, Sadie and the other Linda at the museum. Thank you. Thank you so much. And especially thank you to all of you at home. Um, I'm really lucky to be here with, with you tonight. Um, I'm coming to you from Minnesota, and uh, here, here's where I live. It's a, a house built by Finnish immigrants in, I think, about the 18, 1860, 1862, somewhere in there. And um, I live on a small uh, creek, and through a series of waterways, um, I would actually be able to paddle within, I think, about a half mile of the steps of the museum there in uh, West Virginia. Um, and um, the land I live on, um, I'm very privileged to live here. And um, it's the land of the Ojibwe and the Dakota. And this is the, the river um, that separates uh, Minnesota from Wisconsin called the St. Croix River, and it's a national park. Uh, pots have a way of warming and warming their ways <laughs> into our lives. And um, I, I, I think about them, you know, aside from making them, it's like they function really in, the, in a similar way to a stage set. And um, a stage set um, disappears once the action happens and it reappears and disappears. And pots have that <clears throat> same um, ability when they're at home in, in use. Um, they don't always uh, function in the way that one would hope they would or intend them to, and I, I enjoy that as well. Um, I can't wait to get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee. It's like, oh yeah, coffee is just the, the best thing to do. And then right away um, I get out and I hope who's ever showing this will uh, click, take the cursor and click on the little go button. I just can't wait to get out and ski uh, or bike or run or something like that if there's no snow. But I like to just get right into the studio then and uh, my practice is, is right away I make four cups and the cup seems like such a simple idea but um, it's actually I think fairly hard to make something simple well. Um, so 
that that's what I do every, every day right away. And I work in a little series, always uh, four, usually four of everything. Um, tea is not really the culture that I grew up with, but I, I still like to, to make a, a tea bowl. Uh, plates, I love to make a plate. Um, it's something to, to serve food on or something can rest on there. But also it, it's, it's, it's really a, a canvas in a way, a three-dimensional canvas. Um, and I'm, these are the kind of surfaces that my, my mother would look at and think and say, <laughs> why can't you make something pretty? <laughs> and uh, she probably would be kind of pepped up by this. <laughs> anyway, um, a little bit of glaze. Um, mostly those slip, just a finger through the slip. Uh, fired in the wood kiln, um, and I'm using the atmosphere of the of the kiln more than wood ash. I'm not that interested in wood ash. Uh, some little patterns from uh, shells and wadding. Uh, lately, some black clay. I'm interested in that. Uh, some coffee. You know, back to the coffee, <laughs> coffee pots. I think these are in the show exhibit here at the museum. Uh, baking, winter is really, again, winter my, is my favorite time of year, um, and so I love to, to bake. So I, I always tend to make a lot of baking dishes. Uh, some are really large. This is wouldn't fit in my oven, but maybe a, a commercial oven. This kind of wheel I work on, um, this is my husband, Jeff, and he actually made that wheel. He had a little business uh, making them. Uh, here's the studio I work in, and we've both my husband and I have been working on this for maybe 20, 25 years. I still yet to make any doors for the uh, kiln shed part, um, you know, by the chimney there. And then I've got a little gallery <coughs> area. Help yourself. You can just show up and get some pots if you want them um, in the middle there. And there's there's no doors there either. Uh, soup. I love love to make uh, soup, and basically my motivation is to make a form that I want to use with a surface that I want to use. And so I like I like kind of a V-shaped bowl for soup. A uh, little rice rice bowls. Um, just some more surfaces from the. Um, the kiln gives. I've always liked uh, pal like Palmino Pony, um, Appaloosa Horse, Golden Lab, you know, that those kind of surfaces. Uh, again, a little black black clay and chino and, you know, I like that kind of irregular, rough clay. A basket. A basket has, uh, can, can do so many things. It can hold things, carry things. Um, in, a, in a way, it's, it's one of the forms I, I really love to, to, to make. I, 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 again, I was that kid that just couldn't get it. You know, as a student, it was so hard for me to get any kind of skill. And handles, I thought, were really, really hard. And, and um, I just can't hardly wait to try to make a handle. Um, I'm not saying they're good or anything, but I just love the opportunity so much. A little pandemic. Uh, basket. I very rarely put any kind of graphics on my work, but I thought that the yellow cross was sort of appropriate. Um, kitchen bucket. I think of these for, you know, putting your kitchen trimmings in, um, that kind of thing. Maybe uh, pulling up some carrots from the garden, hosing them off, and, you know, putting them right on the table in, in this kind of a, a form. So I add that wire after the firing. Uh, little sushi plates or snack plates. And um, these I got the idea, uh, I was waiting for my daughter. Uh, she was gonna come on the, on the school bus. And um, I thought, well, what can I make, you know, kind of quickly. So I make these little wire cut plates. So I think my mother would like this turquoise <laughs> uh, glaze. Uh, she probably wouldn't like these too much, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I try to put a you know maybe two or three of these sets um, in a in each firing. So I fire about four to six times a year, 
And, you know, I really think of them, you know, in a way they're like a little painting or a little triptych, a little diptych, that kind of thing. But they're three-dimensional, and I'm failing right now to show you the, the backside, which is, is really almost more important than the, than the front. Um, here's how the pots are fired in this two, I have a two-chambered kiln with a bori box, and it's fairly simple to fire. Um, and wood is, you know, kind of a constant thing. I'm always, you know, every day I do a little bit of work, maybe half an hour. And um, I like putting up wood, and I like making a wood pile. So, you know, that's sort of a, that works out well for me. Um, these are the people that I have around me when I fire. And um, I I love being part of the wood fire community. And, and we have family all over the world, and I love that so much. But at my own kiln, I really keep it quiet. And it's my husband, Jeff, in the right, in the orange. And then Kirk and Jill, um, who have came to me about 24 years ago, and um, I just could never say goodbye. So we've been firing together for um, all these years, maybe 25 years now. So I want to talk a little bit about ideas and where they come from, you know, eating, using pots, food, you know, of course, those are the natural things that we know, know about. But other things happen in our lives, and I would call these sort of things like visual taunts or curiosities. And I'll just give you a couple examples of my taunts. Um, so somebody uh, gave me a zucchini, and, and I, I really didn't want it, and I threw it off the porch, and it broke. And then I thought, well, that's not very nice. So I, I, I took a knife, and I cut it, and the minute I cut it, I went, oh, my God, it looks like that fire extinguisher. So I spent about, I don't know, maybe half an hour trying to get the right uh, length. And then I would place them on this bench and I was trying to get the right distance between them. I mean, it's kind of like the Twin Towers. It's like, what was beautiful about the Twin Towers? Really, it was the space in, be, in between them. Uh, just some other towers in a way. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, you know, the, the, through use, you know, the, the, the revelation of that black underneath through time and then comparing one to the other. You know, you line up a board of cups, you know, what are you looking at? You know, how do they compare? Oh my God, I just love these so much. I wish I'd made these. Um, there's the phone. I can't turn that off. <laughs> um, my, my daughter gave me this drawing for Christmas, and um, when she gave it to me, I thought, um, God, you know, what, you know, what were you thinking when you made this? And she said, well, I, I just had come up with a, a new system of drawing. And I thought, yeah, system, it's a system. And she, here's a drawing she made, um, you know, years ago. How about that snowsuit? <laughs> With this system, she, she had no system that she had thought about. She, you know, it was just, uh, you know, what kids do. They, they just get a, something and they draw. And I call it the lively line. And so many times we're presented with something that already has a system. And the iPhone is something that is loaded up with systems. And um, I'm really interested in the iPhone uh, with, uh, with a photo and the video as, a, as a, a system. And it's something I don't think I ever would have thought about before. So again, who's ever showing the pictures, go and find that little cursor. And this is my headlamp is turned on at night and I'm skiing in a snowstorm. Sunday paper and um, in the paper there would be the in the sports section 
there were these black and white photos, and I, w I would look at the photo, and it's like, what is going on? And then I would read the caption, and then realize, God, the photo is so bad, you know? So the system, I know, it's like, well, what's the system they're using, you know? And, and then it's like, well, if it were my system, what would I do? And so I just took my pen, you know, I just started kind of doodling on them, and um, I, mean, I kind of have a habit of this. And um, then I start, you know, putting a little color on, too, but um, I'm just trying to show, you know, I'm trying to make things more clear. What's going on? Where is the visual weight? Where should we be paying attention? What, what do I, what do I want to tell you with this, with this photograph? And so, you know, the, those things, all those things sort of apply to, to pots. You know, what's the system? What's going on? What, what am I choosing to act on? What am I choosing to not act on? Um, anyway, I just want to show you one, one idea I had, and it started out as a visual taunt, and um, I got some cooking oil from all over the world, and I was getting ready to fire, and I thought, quick, make some pots. So I made these three little pots on the left, and I put them by the wood stove and got them dry, and I single, I sing, you know, slipped them and glazed them raw. And then I actually got them into the kiln the next day, and they came out. And my idea was, you know, just sample the oil, you know, olive oil. Not, well, I knew about olive oil, but macadamia oil, almond oil, you know, all those sort of oils that I didn't know a thing about. And then every firing, I would just put, you know, one or two, maybe four in to each firing. So what's the purpose of oil and its main job? is to gather dust. So, you know, if these things sit on your table, they're gonna become, you know, dust collectors. So it's like, oh my God, I gotta correct that. So um, I started making, uh, you know, covers, caps for them. You, you might wanna consider vacuuming too. <laughs> anyway, um, here I started realizing, oh, it's really fun to make parts. So, you know, I make four bottoms, four bowls, for uh, chimneys, for caps, and I think I'll I'll do one of these. I'll at least make one of these as part of my uh, demonstration video. So then the idea was, you know, you just get a cup of coffee, snoring dog, bunch of parts, a little public radio, and then just put them together. So just some pairs of um, pots over over the years. Then we got this stove and. Um, it's some distance from our other stove and from where we actually, you know, cut up things to cook. So it was really kind of annoying to me to carry the oil over to the stove. And I thought, aha, I have to do something about this. So I took a piece of paper and I just doodled over time all the things I had loved to carry over my life. And um, a lot of them had this kind of a handle in common. And, it's like, oh, I don't know, it's kind of cute, you know, the wire is kind of wimpy, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know. But I kept, you know, on it and um, eventually used sort of a rubber coated wire and um, just, you know, over the years, just some different ones. And then using, you know, more minimal wire in the lid and then actually carrying about uh, trying to find a way to hold it, make a pot that feels just right when you hold it, um, but it wouldn't be um, apparent from, from uh, at first glance. You wouldn't know what would feel good, but over time it would feel good. And I became sort of obsessed with that sort of an idea, a concept, if you will. And then, you know, it leads to other forms, you know, maybe like a vinegar cruet, like my mom would like that middle one. Uh, and then I started sort of like just drilling a hole in the top and then not be really thinking about what would solve the little, you know, the little thing you would lift. This is, I think, linen cord that I made. <clears throat> Some bigger caps where the cap is actually functions as a little bowl for the oil. Um, I was looking at, uh, it sounds odd, but Nazi flashlights from World War II. It's where these kind of forms came from. Grenades, things like that. Um, I've always liked the little pin, 
you know, that's on a grenade or, or um, a fire extinguisher, you know, that kind of thing. The suggestion, it's the mere suggestion of a handle. Uh, spools uh, from textiles, that kind of thing. And then these are the more re the most recent one I think I fired and um, just looking at funnels and cones that I have in the in the studio. And again, thinking about you know that idea of the twin towers and the space between the the cones, you know, at what point, are they too far apart? At what point are they too close? And what happens in that in that space? And um, I'll finish up here with um, just another little taunt I had. Um, I had a, a little ski accident, um, not last winter, but the one before. And my friend Quinn had given me this cup. And so I took a, a little picture um, of the cup and, and sent it to him. And I had a, actually had a concussion as well, and the, one of the doctors said, you know, you should really not think, you should not do anything. You should just kind of basically just sit down and be quiet and don't do anything, no screens, no TV, no radio, no books, no audio books even, really. But um, so I did, I, I just put my clothes on, warm clothes, and I just sat outside basically for a month. I mean, I, I went inside to eat and all that and sleep, but um, I just did, I just sat outside and, and um, you know, once a headache, once my headaches went away, it was really, it was really pretty great. I, I would highly recommend it to anyone. And um, I realized um, I had to do something. So at night I would allow myself um, just to take one picture <laughs> with my iPhone and um, my cast really, my hand was really always at arm's length. You know, it would, you know, it would just suddenly appear. It's like this blue thing, it would like appear. And it had kind of a life of its own and became kind of like a prop in a way. And um, it was an awful lot of fun. And I, so I made a, quite a few um, photographs and I actually, gave a set to my uh, surgeon who was really brilliant. And uh, I think that's last, the last one. Anyway, there's my family and thank you again so much. I really look forward to seeing all the other talks by our other friends and, um, and watching the, the workshops as well. So again, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry we're not here in person, but thanks again. See ya. A native of California, Justin D'Onofrio was introduced to pottery at Cabrillo Community College. After moving to Colorado in 2013, he found a vibrant clay community and continued his ceramic education at Anderson Ranch Art Center, the Carbondale Clay Center, and the Studio for Arts and Works, ultimately receiving his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. D'Onofrio has been an exhibiting member and tour co-manager of the Artstream Nomadic Gallery and his work is represented by galleries across the United States and abroad. Working in stained clay, his layered forms draw reference from the strata and colored tones found in nature. Justin Nofrio is currently pursuing his Master of Fine Arts in Ceramics at Alfred University in Alfred, New York. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the kitchen table conversation version of my presentation. My name is Justin D'Onofrio, and I'm excited to be here with the Huntington Museum of Art for the Walter Gropius Master Artist Series and Bauhaus Ceramic Symposium. A uh, huge thank you to Kathleen, John, George, and everybody at the museum for having me as part of this event with these true masters of the medium that you can see in this great image um, that the museum provided here. I'm looking forward for this opportunity to learn in this virtual format, and I'm excited to hear from those that are further along in their journeys in the ceramic field. I'm currently in my second year of graduate school at Alfred University, and I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the land that I'm speaking from today by honoring the traditional territory of these six nations. The Mohawk, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Seneca, and the Tuscarora. This morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it may be for you where you are, um, I want to share a little bit of my personal story along with some of the inspirations for my work and I want to kind of end with a little bit of what I've been doing here in school. 
Although I'm from California, originally my family's from a small town southeast of Rome in Italy called Bagnoli del Trino, and you can almost see the family farm in the upper right of this image if you look close. As an artist and a climber, this birthplace of my grandfather was a homecoming that really clarified a huge part of who I am. Um, while this photo doesn't do the rock fixed dwellings justice, I can't help but there's an intern can't help but feel there's an internal memory, excuse me, that impacts my shaping of landscape into something useful. Um, and here's another image. It's a little poor quality, but I like to include it because it gives a nice representation, a better representation of those rock fixed dwellings. My first trip to Italy was in 2007. I was there to study art, although at the time I was um, majoring in marine biology and pursuing an education in sciences. And this trip really, it's an experience solidified a deep respect for history and those that came before me. Um, I studied at the Instituto Italiano in Florence, Italy. And this time really altered the trajectory for me. I decided to stop pursuing that degree in marine biology and instead decided to pursue an ongoing education in the arts. There's a depth of tradition that I immediately connected to with functional ceramics. Perhaps it comes from this intense respect for tradition um, and rules and my Italian heritage. Um, perhaps I can use my great aunt and Eunice philosophy on pasta making to explain my relationship with process. She says, you do these things exactly this way every single time. And every time you do it, it gets better and better. You can see her here on the left. Um, showing off, showing me, she says, uh, you know, I've been doing this since I was five years old. I can do it with my eyes closed, showing me her pasta chopping skills. <laughs> Not nearly as impressive. I'm cutting a slab here on the right, but anyways. Um, the repetition of process is a real driving force behind the work. Um, how I fostered, contradicted, and challenged these is when the work really started to feel like my own. Speaking of repetition, someone that I found great mentorship in was Allegheny Meadows, so Cheers to some afternoon coffee with him. I'll take a sip. Um, and I, I started helping with Artstream uh, Nomadic Gallery in 2013. And I really have admired the culture, community, and family that he's built around the Artstream. In 2013, I came to Colorado in preparation for going back to school. And Allegheny encouraged my partner and I to stay in Carbondale, Colorado, and defer, actually, and get in-state tuition. He even had a place for us at SAW, which is Studio for the Arts and Works. And it was just really a wonderful opportunity to work around many artists from all different mediums. Um, also during that time in the Roaring Fork Valley, which is Aspen at the top, kind of, and then Carbondale there at the bottom, is uh, Anderson Ranch and the Carbondale Clay Center, which really provided these amazing ceramic learning experiences. I also worked for a ceramic artist, or excuse me, uh, I worked for an artist named James Searles, who didn't work in clay, uh, but that provided an this uh, metal fabrication experience and large scale installation that was really, um, for me, uh, a, a big leap in my experience for sure. And so it was a very full year. Uh, the work I was making at the time was still trying to fold in some of my formal training in Italy, both before and after being there, um, you know, drawing and photography. Um, and while, con while I was also continuing this interest with atmospheric firings, and although though the work looks maybe a little different from um, the work I'm making now, themes about humans' relationship with landscape was still the focus. And with this series particularly being substantially less about the function of the pot. In 2014, I transferred to Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I had the privilege of working with Sana Mamami, who's here with us today, and Del Harrow. And so here's a couple pieces uh, from that time. And the program there is very well-rounded, fusing digital technology with historical reverence and deep technical investigations of the materials. Also, at, while at CSU, um, through a desire to investigate volume and scale was the beginning, excuse me, the beginning of an overall shift in the qualities in my work. I began to develop guidelines which brought the process forward through further investigation of how to unify surface and form. I began to consider color in a different way. Color became body and color became skin. And it really marks an important transition where process, form, and decoration started becoming indistinguishable from each other. So those previous small jars were the beginning of building work out of essential geometries, which, lead, which led to exploring more complexity. These ideas kind of build upon each other and expand in this studio through the combining of forms. 
to explore this language of the pot. I was also looking for the physicality of the process to register in the resulting color. So this led to other explorations and saturations and color explorations. The bridge between in the studio and out of the studio also became more clear. Specifically, my life and experience as a rock climber began to feed the work in, in very um, different ways. The terms tension, balance, and compression channel the mental and physical strain of climbing and build relationships with the qualities of the structures and forms. There's an immediacy of feedback in both climbing and clay, as information is sent from the fingertip to the brain. Excuse me. My focus has always been a pendulum that swings back and forth between spending time in the studio and spending time climbing. The front range in Colorado really lended itself easily to maintain the balance between the wilderness and the arts. And so setting down roots there in Fort Collins, Colorado is when the two really began to integrate. The work and the process reflect how I feel when climbing. The emotional and physical struggle are in search of capturing a moment. I often consider the line in the landscape, the constants and variables of climbing and clay. In the studio and out, consistency parallels risk in both the games of control of climbing and clay. As a potter and a climber, I've versed my muscle memory and practice movements, which become a visual language of handling the material. There is a fundamental and sheer tension between the known fixed solutions and the unknown and uncertain terrain of both practices. The scale of these huge glacier drop boulders in Fish of California are one of my favorite places on earth and they never cease to amaze me. Not only does rock provide incredible form study, which dwarf me and my everyday concerns, but then there's color. These images were taken from some of my climbing travel in the Rocky Mountains, which is in the upper left here in Colorado, Rockland, South Africa, which is on the upper right there, Fontainebleau, France is on the lower left, and then Squamish, British Columbia on the lower right. And uh, in each you can see the lichen on the rock, and it's been a source of color inspiration wherever I've explored. Not only is it everywhere you find rock in many places you don't, but it's also the oldest, oldest living organism on Earth. The bright green and orange lichen are especially important for lichenometry, which is a, which is a really awesome tool uh, for dating found objects like arrowheads and ancient tools. Lichens are also sensitive to environmental change, so as bioindicators, their, their presence or absence can tell you the, given, like the health of a given, um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, health of a given environment. Um, and so the green lichen is especially important in lichenomics. You can actually reach back to 10,000 years old um, to date objects on rock faces or tools. And so it's amazing to think how long these vibrant species have been present. I also draw upon old pots and memories alike. Uh, my, mem my family in California and in Italy often lends, di l excuse me, ends dinner with a sweet liqueur, which is usually a homemade limoncello or a sweet wine, something like that. And in these pots, I see a clear integration of all of my influences. Um, however, I'm also curious about what's unclear in the work. One ambition of my process is to capture the ephemeral beauty of wet clay, embracing the cracks and smears frozen by the firing, which can project an immediate sense of the material at the moment of making. This piece is actually in uh, the Walter Gropius exhibition. Uh, here, I mean, it's there, not here. <laughs> I would be there. Um, and then uh, a couple basket forms here. And then another piece that's also included in the exhibition there, which I'm really excited to see the virtual tour we're gonna have soon. Um, so that was kind of a leap forward, but after graduating from Colorado State University, my partner Brooke Cashin, who also is a ceramicist and an amazing assistant here today helping me, um, moved out east to graduate school and I had an opportunity to stay put in Fort Collins and um, take over a recently vacated ceramic studio space. And to maximize my time in that studio, I cut all overheads that I could really to afford the space. Um, that included um, housing for rent um, and many other things. And so for a little over two years, I lived in the studio and I slept in the van at night. And it really allowed for a heightened level of focus within the practice and focus on my work. Another image here of that same studio space from the outside and 
Uh, it was called Art 342, and it used to be a residency program, so it really has the bones of that residency program. And it really, and it eventually became these affordable, rentable spaces, relatively affordable. <laughs> um, but uh, and that span was a immense focus and really invaluable for the work. So in 2018, I took a slight hiatus from that space and packed up the van and headed to the Archie Bray Foundation for a, a ceramics summer residency there. And it was an inspiring to be working around so many different clay artists from different places and different perspectives. A couple picture forms that I made while I was there. And then one direction my color research has gone is in the blending of clays together on a single form and a gradient. These are some of the last pieces that I made before coming back to school. So this is a, an image of memory foam on a wear cart that I use here to transport pieces from the second floor where the studios are to the first floor where the kilns are. So um, you gotta get creative with how to get it down there. Um, and this is a nice transition to look at these impressions of the bottles and the foam to, to see what I've been up to here at school. Uh, one way to see this is that the pots are missing, right? <laughs> I think another way we can look at it is that there's a trace of the process and I think a seed for further investigation. Uh, I've really been enjoying this time to kind of slow down and notice these peripheral moments that might have gone unnoticed before. And so I interpreted that moment in clay, um, interpreted those qualities in, in, sorry, I interpreted those moments in foam and interpreted those qualities in clay. Um, exploring ideas about fossils as another extension of thinking about time. And so this this piece on the left here is a, or piece, this uh, photo on the left here is of uh, the top of a cathedral in Italy, marble, weathered, cut and weathered, cut by humans and weathered by nature. Um, and this sandstone fossil that's found locally here. And the qualities, um, each have qualities that I'm questioning with humans' relationship with objects and nature. And then here's a, here's a photo of one of my reviews, and I'm really digging at something here, willing to be open and allow the process and the work to lead, um, to see what other questions might be there for me in the range between clay and ceramic. The conversations I'm having with the work, with faculty and colleagues is, is really invaluable. Uh, this experience in grad school is ongoing. Um, it's filled with a lot of exploration, um, a lot of questions, and few concrete answers. <laughs> However, I have begun to see connections across the work, and the relationships are folding on themselves and coming full circle, and new ones are being formed. Time has changed. I think I think we can all attest to that in some capacity in our own lives. You know, I, has it intensified? Has it slowed? Has it quickened? Um, the most recent series of work I made during quarantine with a small kiln here in the home and a refocusing within this domestic space. I'm really enjoying these cups and saucers, which are open to this interchangeability. Uh, the cup that you lay on its side to rest while not in use is a beautiful gesture to the importance and care we give to lives, give to objects in our lives. And then this is another cup and saucer from that series of work. And then in this piece I see is more of a sketch. I think it could be amazing sushi platter and sauce bowl someday. Um, uh, how about there's no sushi in Alfred, so that's something Brooke and I are going to have to make on our own. <laughs> Most recently, I've been utilizing some local clays, and I'm really interested in the raw tonal qualities of the clay, how firing or not firing glaze versus no glaze um, are perceived in the objects, how these often um, unconscious separations, subtle unconscious separations and associations are built into our ceramic histories. I strive to make pots which enrich in experience and endure beyond the moment of use. I'm thinking about how to bridge the two spaces between my more recent research-based work and my functional pots, maybe like a line blend between those two. I'm toying with the physical space and thinking about how to forge more relationships between the objects, myself, and others. Thank you again so much for having me. Thank you to the Huntington Museum of Art. Um, thank you to all the other artists. Um, I'm excited to see everything else with the presentations, with the virtual tour, and um, 
you know, it's been a pleasure to be here. I wish we could be there in person, but, um, but I think we're all going to learn a lot from this virtual experience. Thanks so much. Sanam Amani received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in History from James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and a Master of Fine Arts in Ceramics from Alfred University in Alfred, New York. Amami was a resident artist at the Archie Bray Foundation in Helena, Montana, and has lectured at numerous universities across the United States, including Harvard University and the Kansas City Art Institute. She is a studio potter and an associate professor of pottery at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. Drawing from patterns and forms found in history, Amami's functional pots are filled with references to her family and her travels, revealed on her surfaces through stenciled imagery and vibrant colors. Hi everyone, my name is Sana Mamami. Welcome to my studio. This has been a really new experience for me, so I am uh, finding myself uh, humbled and challenged <laughs> by this process, but I'm learning a lot and I think that's part of uh, just being uh, being engaged and present in the world and especially uh, artists that's a familiar place to be for all of us um, i think one thing i often think about is that when i'm too comfortable with what i'm doing that's a good time to start asking questions or introducing uh, new propositions into the um, into the studio practice so in terms of my uh my work this next slide is a photograph of my mother um, when she was a young girl, probably very close in age to um, the age of my son right now. Um, this picture was taken in Iran, probably in the late 40s. Um, my family is Iranian and I was, I was born in Iran. We left during the revolution and came to the United States a few years later when I was 10. And so, um, I think the photographs and the objects that my parents had in the home were always really, um, I was always very curious about them growing up. I wanted to know uh, more about our family. I wanted to know why we left. I wanted to know so much and um, as, as children do, but it turned out that my, my interest was, um, would lead me to becoming a history major as an undergrad. I think I always wanted to, I felt, like I could understand more about our current time if I could understand where we came from. But I think my parents' experience really um, was pivotal in the, um, in sort of my, my interest in history and, and later my interest in um, making pottery and working with clay. But I show this picture because I think when I first uh, saw this picture, of course I thought about my personal relationship to my mom and. Um, she died when I was quite young, and so I, I have uh, pictures of her around the house, but this image in particular struck me for um, this, the way that I felt like it helped me understand something about not only her as a young girl, but the sort of um, social, cultural um, uh, world that she was a part of in Iran. And of course, I loved... Um, I loved looking at the, the pattern of the clothes she was wearing. But it wasn't until many years later where I showed this image at a, at a, um, a lecture I gave at Nsika, and one of my mentors said to me that basically the image reminded her of my work. The veil that she was wearing was creating a sense of, um, almost reminded her of the slip work that I do and the way that I layer patterns and create some areas where the pa patterns sort of recede and are concealed and others where the patterns come through. And I, I realized that, you know, the photograph hasn't changed, but like our relationship with so many things, with people, with books, with uh, our favorite pots or paintings, as we change, our relationship to those things changes. And now this picture has become for me both personal, but also a real sort of way of understanding that um, pattern is complex. Um, pattern is a way that we can make sense of complicated um, emotional experiences, social experiences, cultural experiences. 
and that patterns can tell a story. Um, so this first image of my work that I'm showing is uh, was made in 2002. I think this piece for me captures a lot of the things I think about in the studio and that I hope for in my work. And I think that I'm really interested in, you know, at the core, I think I, I'm really interested in making things out of clay that are intended to be used. But within that, I, I sort of oscillate between uh, tableware and work that is uh, often categorized as a centerpiece or um, work that is intended for display. Um, and so I'm, I think my practice moves back and forth between um, tulip bases, uh, garniture sets, tiles, periodically larger pieces for exhibitions, and then back to tableware. And, and through that sort of moving back and forth, I think I'm able to explore the ideas that I'm really interested in, pattern, history, the Silk Road, um, questions of craft and skill, and really um, the relationship of function uh, to the object that, it, that I'm working on at any particular moment. Um, this piece I think really highlights for me that relationship between ornament, pattern, form, and structure. I also show this last um, sort of uh, image of a source material before I talk about my tableware because I, I, I always want to remember to mention this idea that even though I'm looking at history um, and we can talk about Islamic art and architecture as often being a historical reference, although of course there's contemporary um, influence as well, um, I think that I always really want to talk about the sort of way that I don't look at these older pieces as old. I know that this, this bowl was made in the 12th century in Kashan. I know that, you know, many <laughs> centuries have passed, but I look at this piece and I actually see how contemporary it is. I see the um, Islamic and Iranian potters as being radical and um, really the beginning of, of how we understood abstraction. I mean, these artists were abstracting the world around them and making sense of the world around them through pattern. And I think that's a really powerful idea. I think sometimes when people ask me, well, why do you make tableware? And what is it with pattern? And I think of um, the way that tableware grounds my practice. It gives me a place to start. Um, but offers me endless possibility. And I would say the same about pattern. I feel like pattern allows me to interpret the world around me. It's a universal language. It's a way for me to share my ideas with um, a really wide audience. And I think the, um, these you know, beautiful uh, historical pots, I think they show us the complexity of the language of pattern. What I love about this plate is that, um, you know, you see these different bands of pattern. And so you have the pattern on the lip and then you have the Kufic script or the calligraphy where language is almost abstracted. And then you have these almost floral patterns and then you have a sort of foliage pattern in the middle. And I just think this language of pattern is fascinating. I think the way that we organize the world and interpret the world through pattern is, is, um, is really ripe with possibility. And I, I, I don't think of that as a modern or historical um, premise. I think that's something that humans have done, you know, um, over thousands of years. Um, often people ask me about my color palette this next image shows um, just a detail that I took when I was on my trip in Iran, and this is a in Shiraz, and I, you know, I just took a detail of this wall where you can see, you know, maybe one, two, three, four, five patterns kind of compressed together and really bold, bright colors. And I don't think I use the work directly. You don't see the direct influence, I think, in my work, but I'm always thinking about colors, these bright, bold colors, and the way that um, 
the way they all interact together and also kind of this idea that multiple patterns could coexist in one piece I think is something that I've also been exploring uh, with the tableware. So I'll just end with some examples of tableware and uh, the shift in my work to this brighter color palette. Um, and again, this idea of trying to make families or groups of uh, pieces that aren't identical, but are uh, similar. So you'll see that in the process videos as well. I'm making a series of dinner plates that could all live together, but they're all different. Um, so this first uh, plate, this is a dinner plate with this, um, again, a, a way that I've been thinking about pattern right now where the shapes repeat, but they sort of have, um, they don't repeat in the exact same way. Um, this next slide shows two plates side by side, and I think I'll talk, and this, I, I do talk about this in the process videos I talk about. I have two different clay bodies that I work with. Uh, one is a buff clay, and I use a black slip over it with a matte glaze, and then the other is a dark colored clay that I put a white slip and a shiny glaze, but the pattern and the stencils here are, are the same. And I really love this relationship that the matte and the shiny go together. Um, the patterns, you know, are the same, but the glaze really transforms them. Um, this next slide is an image I took of a dinner set that I was commissioned to make, a 12-person dinner set. And it was a really amazing opportunity for me to think about creating essentially, uh, you know, 80 pieces for a home that were all designed to live together and to coexist, but they were all different. And so again, you can see that I use a very, I use very few glazes, but I'm able to get a range of, of um, colors and surfaces by using different clay bodies and um, using both opaque and matte glazes and then shiny and uh, clear glazes. Um, and then just a few months ago, this is a really recent work um, that I made for the Artstream Nomadic Gallery, which I've really been honored to be a part of the last few years. Um, I, you can see, again, this idea, similar ideas of patterning. The cup on the left is a lighter colored clay um, with black slip and, and a matte white glaze. Um, and then the shiny palette on the right with the chocolate colored clay. Um, the only thing I would say about the very, very recent work is that I've been um, just kind of playing with masking off some of the underglazes so that they, like that red in the bottom left that you'll see on the cup where it kind of pops forward um, and is this really bright, vibrant color in a sort of muted, um, you know, amongst a, a fairly muted color palette. And the last slide is a covered jar. There is another covered jar similar to this in the exhibition at the Huntington Museum. Uh, covered jars are another of my favorite shapes that I've been working on the last few years. And um, again, a way for me to explore these new ideas of color and pattern within, within this volume. So that's the end of my slide talk. Thank you very much. Chris Gustin is a studio potter and emeritus professor at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. He received his BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute and his MFA from Alfred University in Alfred, New York. Gustin's work is in numerous private and public collections, including the Renwick Gallery at the National Museum of American Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. He has received two National Endowment for the Arts Artist Fellowships, and he is the co-founder of the Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts in Newcastle, Maine. Gustin's work explores the vessel form while increasing scale, changing the reference of the forms to be more closely related to the human body. His glazed and wood-fired surfaces become like a skin on these voluminous forms, accentuating every curve and dimple. Hello all. Um... Thank you for being here today. It's a great honor to be part of the Huntington Museum of Arts Walter Gropius Symposium. 
And uh, today I am going to talk about uh, my work over the last, say, 15, 20 years and, and life influences that have affected my thinking and, and how my work has kind of moved over that period of time. Uh, in 1995, I was invited to go to the island of the uh, of Fayel in the Azores and uh, to be part of this big symposium to make work and make art and then for five or six, five weeks, I guess it was, and then travel, have the work travel around Europe in exhibitions. And uh, when I got there, uh, they told me that, that they had no clay and I wouldn't be able to work in clay. And uh, this was, you know, this is one of those moments in your career where it's, it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because um, this was 1995. There was no, internet was very weak at that point. And it's not like you could buy art materials on the island. So um, I had to struggle with the concept of making pots without ceramics, okay, without clay. And what I did was, um, uh, these are volcanic islands. So, I, so at the end of the island, um, there was this volcano and I went out and I spent a day just kind of pondering what the possibilities are that I could do. And I realized that I was actually sitting in it. Um, the volcano is this big cauldron and it was actually a big pot. And so I, I, the answer was sitting under my feet. It was um, lava, basalt. And so what I did is I went to the quarries and uh, got a bunch of big stones and had them delivered to the studio spaces. And then for the next month, I started carving lava pots. And this is one of those moments where you change your thinking in relationship to, to kind of what your understanding of your processes are. Um, up until that point, I'd been making pots, dealing with a single wall um, vessel. Um, you know, my whole career has been based on that up until that point, um, you know, throwing and hand building and, and uh, combining wheel thrown and hand built forms, but all with this idea of this volume being contained by the skin around it. And uh, uh, by making double walled um, or by making carved forms that were reductive in nature, it just changed how I, how I thought. And, and so I made these, these, these big lava pots and out of that came a, a new way of thinking of how I might approach the work I'm making in my studio. So I come back to the United States and I immediately building start building double wall pots. And what was what I really enjoyed about this was I could think about the inside completely different than I thought about the outside, yet still maintain the vessel as kind of the structure and content that holds it all together. So for, I don't know, a year or two, I just started, two to three years, I guess, I was building these kind of smaller forms, um, kind of tabletop, um, but got really interested in how to play with that interior volume being contained by all these kind of low B forms. Um, but the pots start, started to talk to me in a different way. They kept kind of asking to get larger. They kept kind of saying, well, you know, we need to be bigger than you're making us. And um, uh, again, these are the moments where you start to challenge technique and your skill set and all these things, and you just have to kind of open that door and be willing to go through it. So I went back into the studio um, in about 1988, 1998, 1999, and just started, started to think I was going to really knock this up in scale and began to make these big pieces. And um, these are all four or five feet tall maybe three to four feet in diameter. So they take up a lot of physical space. And I got really into it and I'd build them the interior at the same time as the exterior and kind of combine them all at the end. And uh, out of that came a whole new way of thinking for me. Um, these are some of the pieces that came out of that series. It was about a three to four year series of work. Um, and I was really excited by where this was all going. It was, it was like a door that had opened that I wanted to walk through and just explore. Uh, at about this time, 2001, I got a phone call from my younger brother, David. And uh, David told me that he had just been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS, and that um, things weren't great. And so I flew out to California and which was the beginning of a number of trips I took over the years um, 
to, to see him and to see how he's doing and to talk with him. And um, David was diagnosed at uh, age 48, and the disease progressed through him very quickly. Um, and in these conversations we had, we talked about um, how does one let go of the things you love and still have grace and peace in doing it? And they were kind of profound in many ways because it was playing out in real life um, with with both of us. And I would come back home and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd start thinking about my life and how can I let go of certain things and how can I hold on to the things that are precious and let go of the things that are kind of extraneous to what I want to do. And I brought that into the studio as well. And I started thinking of my own work. And, and so everything was very, with the constructed forms that are very convoluted and very complex and structure and building. And I decided that I'd just begin to erase that again, just let go of it and get it back down to kind of an essential core self. And out of that body, uh, out of that thinking came a big body of work. Um, the scale, um, again, the, the constructive pots were kind of large and big, and so I stayed on that scale, but I just softened everything so that the sense of the hand against the pot and the sense of hand on skin was, um, was really um, accentuated in the work. Now, in 2005, uh, I got a phone call um, uh, to basically telling me that my brother had died. And, uh, and for all of you who who lost loved ones, um, you know how difficult it is to, to deal with this kind of loss. It's existential. And uh, I had this body of work in my studio. And uh, the, I had an exhibition scheduled uh, for a month later or six weeks later, and I didn't want to do it, but I decided I would to honor David with this body of work because it came out of his experience and my experience with him and my my experience as a, as a brother and, and grief. And um, so I decided to honor him. I glaze everything white. So so I put together the show and the entire exhibition was shades of white and, sur and, and very muted surfaces and just let the form be what it is and really reduce the activity to just gesture, light and gesture. And out of that came a new, whole new way of thinking about making work, but also about thinking of how my work might um, uh, expand its, its, its thinking if I introduce it into the wood, wood kiln process, the wood firing process. Um, I was interested in kind of the surface and how over such a long, uh, large piece of real estate, if you will, the sidewall of a piece, you can really get some things to happen on a scale that you can't do like on a teapot or in a, you know, it's more intimate scale. So, so this brought back kind of memory to me and me memories of childhood and, and things that I loved as a kid. And one of the things that, that has always stuck with me for years and years and years is an early memory of uh, my earliest memory of, of dust motes in sunlight in my bedroom. And the wonder I felt of discovering that there's this whole kind of invisible world that's in my room that I don't even see. But if the sun comes in just right, all of a sudden it's exposed to me. And I think about that a lot when I think about glaze. I think about how glaze can be this emotive surface on a form, and you see it in one sensibility from a distance, but if you really get close, it can open the door to a whole new world that's kind of the interior, in the interior of the glass, if you will. So, so that's what I think about, and that's how I approach glazing, and that's how I approach surface, and it's how I approach wood fine. You know, so I spent years developing glazes that would run and pool and, and, and create this kind of gl this glass flow that was much like liquid, you know, very low viscosity, and how the, that flow would move over uh, the, the little bumps and divots and little extenuations that I do on the form um, to reveal the topography underneath it. And that exploration led to a whole body of work that came out of the, um, you know, 2008 to 2015, 16, um, with making vessels. So I'd take these big pots and I'd glaze them and then, um, you know, I'd run tests in kilns and then see something I like and I'd put it, put them on the pots. And then, 
uh, I'd fire him and I'd have to stand back and go, okay, how can I make this better? Or is this is pretty good? Or, uh, you know, how can I fire the kiln better with more control? And so over a number of years, I would um, fill these, the, the kiln with these big pieces and with a lot of other work from other people and friends and, and figure out how to fire wood kilns, how to fire an anagama. And I got my kiln pretty dialed in, and I was interested in that. I was interested in, you know, getting things that worked. So these are a series from, from the mid-2012 20, you know, to 2015, somewhere in there. And, you know, all large scale, they're all, like, you know, five feet tall in that scale, human scale. And, um, and revealing just kind of the gesture of the form underneath and try to speak to the emotive quality of the figure and how that can resonate with a viewer, how it can bring memory and experience into how you view an object and make a connection on that level rather than a purely intellectual level. Um, a studio shot of me building one of the big balloon vases and then the vase that came out of that. And again, you know, it's like the viscosity of the glaze and how it rolls over that form. And then right as it's moving down that, that big volume, it starts to kind of coagulate and gloop together and then gets these big drippy rivulets. You know, and that's how liquid moves. That's how, how um, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it defines the surface underneath and it expresses the volume. It like just doubles the amount of air in there um, because it's acting as a covering that is being responsive to the air of the volume of the form, um, which again, connects to emotion. Um, I was invited in 2011 to go down to the St. Petersburg Clay, which is in St. Pete's, Florida, and fire their wood kiln with Don Wrights and John Balistrieri and Matt Long. And um, this was a, a big onagama that, that had been built there, but fired very, very infrequently. And um, and Don really didn't know how to fire it. Uh, John didn't know how to fire it. Matt didn't know how to fire it. And by say that, I mean, we could figure out how to get it hot, but how do you fire a kiln where it's, you know, everything is just rich and beautiful? You know, you could have beautiful moments in the kiln, but how do you do it for the whole kiln? So, um, so we fired this thing and, and uh, out of that came this wonderful kind of conversations about firing and methodologies and how do you do it. And, and so, so over the years I've been firing with, with John and Matt in a number of places around the country um, doing workshops, fired with Don a number of times um, or a few, yeah, a number of times before he died. And in all those times I'd like brought my work down um, I discovered that, uh, you know, the glazes I use at home, are they come out completely differently than the glazes I use in other places. So this is an example of, of a, a glaze in my studio on the right and then uh, the Morian on the left. And, and um, it's the same glaze, just fired in different kilns. So I decided that I would kind of seek out other kilns around the country and see if I could come out and fire and do workshops and that type of thing. And so I went out to uh, Mounds Onagama, Dan Anderson's place in Illinois to fire and, and Randy Johnson and Jan McCahey's in Wisconsin, um, uh, Don Wright's studio at Wright's Ranch, um, Dan Finch's kiln in Bailey, North Carolina. And of course my studio I fire all the time and then um, Brian Nettle's studio in Pastor Christian, Mississippi. And all these kilns, um, uh, they all fire differently. They work differently. You have to different strategies to, to move heat. You have to load them differently. You can't bring the thinking of one to the other without making accommodation. And I love the idea of trying to understand process through different, different means in different situations. Being, you know, I had a skill set, but I didn't necessarily have control. And I loved putting myself in situations where I don't necessarily have the control. So um, uh, this is, again, an example of the same glaze in two different kilns. And this is the same glaze as the previous two in the Wright's kiln at a Wright's Ranch. Now, up until this time, I've been doing, for, for almost 20 years, 20 plus years, uh, I was doing um, vertical forms. And so the sense of topography on the form and this was the skin of the form was a vertical in nature, which leads one to a certain 
human analogy, if you will, a figurative analogy. But I decided I don't want to play with that and screw around with that. So, so I decided to make a big set of platters um, to be more, you know, to work on horizontal surfaces. And this is a series that came out of that. And then I'd again take these platters and put them all around the country in different kilns and see what kinds of analogies and surfaces I could get that would bring a viewer to leading them thinking in one direction versus another based on either color or surface or, or form. So um, uh, these are the wet ones in the studio and then, I, and then these are fired in different kilns around the country. So I was, I was interested in this. I was interested in how, um, you know, the idea of landscape can begin to figure into my thinking, you know, um, uh, natural landscape, you know, um, and, and as glaze moves across something, you know, the, 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 the flow of it becomes, starts to become like water moving over rocks. And um, uh, so, so, you know, and in this piece, it's, it's almost like a, a landscape covered in snow and what that feels like. And then this is just kind of turbulent, kind of the, 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 the result of liquid moving around rocks and boulders and swirling back, back eddying on itself. Um, these, they all do different things, and I'm really interested in how one is, is very different than the other. Now, in 2014, I was invited to go out to the Art Hebrew Foundation and do a residency there, and I decided that it wasn't worth going unless I changed something I did. So I decided to ask a question about assumptions and the things I think about and, and just throw a wrench in the work. So I came up with the fact that every piece I make usually starts with a circle. So I said, okay, well, I'm not going to start with a circle. I'm going to start with an oval. And out of that one decision, just the next five years of work came, you know, just just stretch that oval out, just, you know, stretch that circle out into an oval and what happens. And it's huge what happens. It changes the dynamic of form completely. Um, one thing very obviously is it creates a front and a back, you know, with two smaller sides. And, and that changes how you think. That changes how you um, associate with an object. So I made four of these. Um, three of them blew up in the kiln. I was able to get one of them home. And, uh, and started thinking about, you know, what's next? Where do I move from this? And the question that came out of this body for me was that I was trying to make, make um, these all vessels. I was trying to put necks on them. I was trying to create an interior space that had access. And these, pot, these pieces, I, I keep calling them pots, these pieces just kept saying, no, 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 no. We don't want that. We just want to be form. And I finally just had to listen to that. And out of that decision to just kind of go with that shift, which was a huge one for me because I've made pots my entire career, um, just magic kind of happened in the studio. So, so from about 2015, 2016 on, this is what I've been working on, um, or kind of one of the main bodies of work I've, I've been working on. Um, you know, and I had to figure out how to build again. So I had to go back to beginner's mind. And I, I love creating problems where you have to kind of question the solutions that you do, that you come up with. So you don't, you can't do them all the time. You have to come up with something new. And, um, you know, this, that sense of unknowing is really powerful. It's really a place I try to find in my work. You know, if you get too good at what you're doing, then it can be problematic. So I'm always trying to throw wrenches in what I'm doing. To, to get a further understanding of what might be possible. So this is a series of pieces that came out of those early explorations. And uh, this one's gas fired, but then I'd take them and throw them in the wood kiln and figure them out that way, you know, and figure, again, figure out how to fire the kiln to, to make um, these kinds of surfaces happening. And um, so this same piece with two different sides and two very different characters, um, two different um, kind of emotional um, uh, uh, experiences, if you will. And when I'm looking at a piece like this, one of the things I always look at, I always look at the history of art to think how, you know, not to replicate an image or anything, but to, to, to see possibilities in someone's work that I might be able to bring into mind. And I've always looked at Chinese landscape painting in the 17th, 18th century, um, particularly. 
And, you know, I just love this painting. It's, 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 you know, the amount of humidity in this is, is huge. Everything's moist and wet and damp and, and there's, it's so sensuous. You know, you can feel it in your body. You can feel it in your lungs. Um, and it's just this incredibly quiet contemplative space. Um, and that's what I want my work to be. I want it to be quiet and contemplative. I don't want you to get it in one move. So this is a series of um, pieces that came out of that exploration. And these are all, you know, four, four feet, three, four, five feet, depending on the piece. Um, and uh, depending on the kiln, some are brighter, some are cooler, some are louder, some are softer. But again, I, I, I'm interested in kind of understanding the differences between that and how color and surface and form can lead you there. Uh, this one with a, you know, kind of a waterfall coming down that ridge. You can really feel the kind of a, a, a stereal landscape underneath it. And then on this one, you know, it's just really quiet and soft and that, that sense of the understructure of the, of the piece is just bulging and kind of pushing and moving. And you get a sense that if you turn away, you know, one of those lumps might end up being in a different place. Um, I look at, again, I talk about looking at art history and, and um, Michelangelo is somebody I look at a lot, especially his um, sketches and drawings for his studies for his larger works. And I love the, the research and trying to understand the energy of those two figures doing battle and, 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 and how those figures connect and the, the, you know, the muscle, muscle tension within it. And how can I bring that thinking into the work? How can I ask those kinds of questions? Um, when you're making bigger work, you have to move it around. So this gives you a sense of scale of some of the pieces. Um, and the sense of weight. And, uh, and again, I like that moving from a very large scale, which has one way of entrance to moving to a much smaller scale. And so this is that piece photograph. And then going back to down to smaller scale and bringing vessels back into it and doing a series of cloud jars. You know, this whole series I kind of call the cloud series because um, there's an ethereal nature in clouds. You can't kind of name it, you know, you can't name the image. Um, your mind has to create a uh, context for it. And, and that, that's something I find really beautiful. Um, so these are uh, some, some jars, and, and one of these is in the Huntington uh, exhibition, um, and uh, some finished, finished ones. And then, and then from here, you know, I roll, I'm always thinking about new things, and so how do, how do you begin the piece? And, and these are pieces that you know, instead of starting on a flat surface, you know, now they're rolling around again. So, so this is, you know, where they're sitting on themselves, if you will, you know, the, the orientation is, is not from a flat plane. It's, it's, it's just kind of bumpy and rolling and it finds its own place. Um, and I'm interested in that as well as how, how an object can, can change by where you set it and how you set it. So um, this is a series from last year, and these are smaller in scale because I'm trying to figure this out, figure out how to begin a piece, how to end a piece. Um, and again, by using different color and firing methods in different kilns, I'm finding um, that the analogies shift between piece to piece, even though the forms might be similar in some ways. Um, but by using color and surface, the, the, how, you, how you enter a form through memory is different. And then these last pieces are, um, I made this past spring during the COVID, um, uh, you know, when we were all kind of shut down for a few months. And these are starting to get um, a little bigger. And that's where this work is going. The, the next series will probably be two or three times the scale. And then I'll have to kind of figure out the struggle in that. So that's where I am in my work. And, and um, I always end the, uh, a slide talk by talking about this group of young people. Um, uh, these have been my assistants over the last 20 years, and I couldn't really have done any of the work I do in my studio without their help. They've been instrumental in everything, and I always want to honor that. Um, they've given me um, usually two to three years of their life um, uh, working with me, and I'm incredibly appreciative of that. And then lastly, I'd like to just acknowledge my wife, Nancy Train-Smith, who is a, a fascinating and a great artist. And 
um, uh, one who, um, you know, she and I have had 30 plus years of conversations about art and they all end up in my studio. That, that dialogue that we have is so important to me. And um, I want to acknowledge it because I, I think that um, you know, finding somebody that you can really talk to you about your work is really important and um, who can be straight with you. So, um, and believe me, Nancy, <laughs> she's really straight with me. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, that's where I am. Uh, and uh, I just want to, once again, thank everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for participating in the Gropius uh, Symposium. And thank you, Huntington Museum of Art. Forming the collaboration known as Bandana Pottery, Michael Hunt and Naomi Dowblish live and work in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Gathering and processing local clays from their area, their wood-fired pots reveal the raw nature of the material through the layers of slip and glaze. Michael Hunt was first introduced to clay in high school, then went on to Penland School of Crafts, where Will Ruggles and Douglas Rankin became his teachers and mentors. Hunt continued his studies in Korea, where he learned the traditional method of making large ongi storage jars. Naomi Dowlish began making pottery as a child with her grandmother. She went on to study clay at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. Dowlish came to Penland for a kiln building class and met Hunt, who was building a kiln at his own studio in the area. They now work together, each participating in all aspects of the process as bandana potter. As artists, and more specifically potters, what moves us to make what we do and what brings life to that work? Thinking about this question made me think back to some of the original choices we made about our work. Michael and I began using wild local materials as a means to find the kind of coarse beauty that we love in old Korean pots. We were drawn to functional pots because it's satisfying to make something beautiful that can be used. We chose to live in the mountains of Western North Carolina because of the community we found surrounding Penland School and because of the abundance of interesting local materials for our pots and scrap wood from the local sawmills for our kiln. However, we didn't anticipate and possibly don't even yet fully understand the ways that these materials, approaches to making, and our place in community have shaped us in return. In our search for meaning and beauty, it is the mysterious, ever-shifting interface between ourselves and these elements that leads us into a constantly new and expanding territory. The main clay body that we use is a mixture of the coarse red clay that you see here on the left that comes from just right down the road in our community of Bandana and the more plastic secondary clay that's in the middle, that gray clay. Both of these clays come from the fields of farmers who have their own relationship with this dirt. Once our neighbor who farms on the red clay that we use uh, spontaneously brought us a bucket load in his tractor of the red clay when he was preparing his field. And we were sort of tentatively asking him what part of the field it came from, was it the same as the clay that we had gotten before. And he looked at us in mock indignation and said, I'm a farmer, you think I don't know my own dirt? Whereas he is intimately aware of the organic composition and how water drains or doesn't in this kind of dirt, we have come to know the landscape of particles, color, and working properties of it. Although we come from different backgrounds, we all have a deep respect for and relationship with this wild dirt and recognize that in each other. Um, the way we uh, mix our clay is we start with the clay from the ground and then put it into the green barrels on the right. And we mix it with a lot of water into a slip and screen it through a screen into the big um, water tank on the left. And for us, like the screen is really um, we think of it as a paintbrush. It's an expressive tool that's going to determine the landscape of the clay under the glaze. Um, since we're starting with a clay that has a lot of impurities, how much of the impurities we remove is really um, controls the texture. Um, after the clay, um, after we mix the clay, we then pump it into these drying racks, and it dries from anywhere from about a week to you know a month. Um, 
if it's if it's wet out. These clays are local, but we also like to call them wild clays because they inhabit their own very unique character that can sometimes be unpredictable and really interesting to use. Some of the most exciting times in the studio are when we're taking this wild clay in its pure form into the studio for the first time to just test it out and see what it's good at doing. Um, it might not be plastic enough to throw a pitcher, but reveals the most beautiful texture when you carve a foot. Or maybe there are so many fine particles in the clay that it records your fingerprint. Rather than feeling limiting, these qualities invite us to explore the nature of the clay. Our bandana red clay feels like an old friend. The varied particles of sand and rock lend themselves well to a layered landscape under slip and glaze. And we are fascinated by the texture that is revealed when we cut a foot or carve into the clay. Our slow turning Korean style kick wheels are tools that we feel help us have a more direct connection with the clay. On these low momentum wheels, it's a little harder to impose an idea. You have to use softer clay and a softer touch, um, a quality that we hope is still, uh, can still be felt in the finished pots. Um, in addition to throwing, we do a lot of hand building in our studio. Um, these pots are all made by carving out of a solid lump of clay, um, which is a new technique that we've started doing well the last number of years. And it's really fun, the reductive process allows us to really explore a lot of different shapes. Um, these triangle bowls were made in that same way by taking a triangular block of clay and just kind of scooping out the shape of a pot. And then after it dries, then we um, cut the foot on it. Um, these are slabs that will be molded over biscuit molds. And one of the things that is so fun about these is that um, we get to decorate them while they're flat. Um, you don't get to do that in pottery very much, but um, we decorate them first and then put them over a mold, which you know really is a fun way to um, really be free and expressive with the slip because you don't have to deal with, um, with gravity. And um, we like to work in big runs when we can. And um, like we make a big run of plates and then decorate them all at once. And we think that this you know, creates an environment where we can respond in the moment to what is happening. And maybe we realize that the slip is making a cool splatter when we move it in a certain way. And that the series of plates can kind of become exploring that movement. Once we have um, all the pots made for a firing, we have to race to get them dry so we can glaze them and fire them in the wood kiln. And so we put around 600 pots in the firing and fire the kiln about three times a year. Um, we also have a smaller kiln we can fire in between these longer cycles. Um, now that our kids are a little bit older, they can just load the kiln for us while we sit back and have a cocktail. Um, here's our, uh, our previous apprentice, Jason Hartso, firing the kiln. Um, our current apprentice is uh, Miki Palchik, and it's been a great program to have, um, you know, be able to have apprentices that um, help us in the studio, and then I, we hope learn a lot in the process. Firing in a wood kiln certainly relates to this notion of interacting with wildness. We delight in the search to understand the path of the flame, the vagaries of falling ash and fluctuating atmosphere in the kiln, yet this does not diminish the mysterious power of the process. Although results can be unexpected and sometimes initially disappointing, there's a sense that there's always something new to discover in the complex interplay between clay, slip, and glazes and these firing dynamics. Um, because we have a large kiln that has a lot of um, different zones, um, there's different te uh, temperature zones, different atmospheric zones, and so we use a lot of different glazes to uh, benefit from that variety. Um, yeah. A lot of different ash glazes. Many of our glazes are based on local materials. Um, this glaze is a glaze. It's made from a feldspathic stone that we gather in the town of Kona, which is about, um, it's the next town down from um, Bandana. And we grind that stone up and um, that's the glaze on the right. Um, this pot is um, slipped with, our, we call it our, the Bandana Kaolin and it's Kaolin 
right across the street from our studio in Bandiana. And um, we mix that into a slip and use that um, on a lot of the pots. Um, this glaze is our Nuka glaze, which is made from rice husk ash, wood ash, and feldspar. And it's, it's a really exciting glaze. It never really comes out the same way twice, but hopefully we like all of the different ways that it comes out, um, although not always. Um, this is the back of our barn where we keep um, our glaze test library. So I began making pots as a child with my grandmother who was a high school art teacher. And then when I went to Earlham College in Indiana, I uh, studied ceramics as my major and was able to spend a semester in Mexico uh, studying with a family of potters. And that's uh, what's going on here. They also fired in a wood kiln, but to uh, a low temperature, basically bisque temperature, and then actually passed the, along the pots that they made to other potters that would decorate them and glaze them and sometimes even just paint them for decorative wear with like acrylic or oil paints. While I was in Mexico, I was also lucky to be able to visit a lot of amazing museums where I saw um, the pre-Columbian figurative sculptures that are so prevalent and well known there and they really inspired the figurative sculpture work that I do. I was a core student at the Penland School of Crafts where I studied with a lot of great potters and um, was mentored by um, Will Ruggles and Douglas Rankin. And later I met this amazing potter, um, Oh Hyang Jong, who was an Ongi master from um, southwestern South Korea. And he worked um, in Chola province where they have a technique of using slabs instead of coils. And it's a really great way to make big pots very quickly and um, that have an amazing um, paddle texture. Um, and this is a technique that goes back thousands of years in Korea of making large fermentation jars. And um, one of the things that I really was inspired by by the Ongi pots is the spontaneity of the patterns. The pots are quickly glazed in a glaze of red clay and ash. And then a, a pattern, well, before the glaze dries, the uh, pattern is made by finger wiping. Um, and in a traditional pottery, you know, there would be a number of potters making lots and lots of pots every day, and one glazer who had to glaze a lot of pots very quickly, but still had time to make these beautiful, very free patterns on the pots. Um, we still make Ongi pots in our studio. Um, these are a large series that we made a few years ago. Um, um, and then these ones um, did not have the traditional Ongi glaze, but we, um, we reduction cooled them in our wood kiln. We met at Penland School about 17 years ago, where I had once been a course student, and where Naomi was taking a kiln building class. I was starting to build a kiln in the area, and she stayed to help me finish the kiln, and then never left. Um, we, quick, we quickly began working together, and now consider our pots to be one body of work. Um, and a lot of people ask us um, how we collaborate on the pots. And um, really, we think of it as one body of work. We both do all parts of the making process. We both make, we both decorate. But we each have, we, we, we share ideas. We kind of steal ideas from each other. Um, this is an example of the pot on the left I made and decorated. And uh, the pot on the right, Naomi made and decorated. And here's an example of a pot where this is a pattern that um, I first came up with with Wax Resist, and Naomi started doing it and quickly got um, much better at it than me. So this is a pot that I made and then she decorated. As makers, a strong yet elusive force that works on us is the landscape we call home. I've often had the experience of driving back to my childhood home in, this, in Southern Indiana, of returning to something so familiar, I feel it in my bones. The trees, sky, and gentle hills fall into a pattern that I recognize almost as part of my own body or that of a loved one. On a recent trip, uh, my family went fossil hunting in the creek near my parents' home, and Michael pointed out that the crinoids we found there were surprisingly similar to the carved vases I had recently been making. These connections don't always happen consciously, 
But just as there is no doubt that the shape and disposition of my own body affects the way that I touch clay, surely my sense of space, proportion, and surface is shaped by the way the horizon meets the sky in our mountains, the dense intersection of branches and leaves in our woods, and the layers of rock and moss around our studio. Just as a home is not only where you've chosen to have a house, a cup is not just something in which to put coffee. We enjoy thinking about functional pottery as a subversive art form. Someone may bring a cup into their house simply thinking that it will be a nice thing to put their coffee into, but through daily interactions with that object, they enter into a slow conversation with the maker. The life of the pot began with our explorations of the materials, processes, and sense of holding space. It continues when someone folds it into their lives, handling it thoughtlessly or mindfully through their daily actions and making their own creative decisions about how it should hold food or flowers. In the life of this person, a pot may take on a meaning entirely beyond what we as makers could have imagined, and we try to leave space for that to occur. If meaningful art is about making connections and sharing our experiences and observations with each other, then this is one direct way to get there. These are a few images of recent work. Um, this pot is a, a large platter that's a uh, nuka glaze uh, with white slip underneath it. Um, this is a series of plates. These plates um, have wax resist with an iron wash over top. Um, this bowl has the bandana kale and slip and a clear feldspathic glaze over top of it. And it's, re it's a really great example of the interplay between the coarse clay, how much we screen the clay, the slip, the fire, all of those thicknesses work together to sometimes create this blushing effect. Um, here's a couple of more pots with brushed on white slip. In the act of making, there is a vibrant intersection between ourselves and the unknown. Like dancers balancing the weight of each other, if we lean into that place in the spirit of discovery, something leans our way that is worthy of exploration. To us potters, these sources of mystery may be wild materials and processes, the people and places that make our home, or the function of a pot after it leaves our hands. It is a sometimes scary or frustrating, yet fruitful territory. And I'll leave you with this quote by the dancer Agnes DeMille, who says it very well. Living is a form of not being sure, not knowing what next or how. The moment you know how, you begin to die a little. The artist never entirely knows. We guess. We may be wrong, but we take leap after leap in the dark. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Walter Gravius Master Artist Ceramic Symposium Lectures, and thank you to all of the artists. Please continue to follow all of the events surrounding the Walter Gravius Master Artist Ceramic Symposium, found on the museum's website, YouTube channel, and all social media platforms. Thank you. <laughs>